Brody King here on the Sessions podcast. It's happening. I'm pumped about this. But you just hopped on the Zoom call. Um, You just dropped your kids off to school. What a doozy it is getting out the house with kids, huh? Like, what is happening? Well, it <laughs> takes it takes like a lot of like emotional endurance. You've got to be able to carry as many things as possible. Like, it's a shit show out there. What? <laughs> well, how was your experience this morning? Uh, yeah, you. I mean, today was pretty smooth sailing. I mean, really, the only hiccup is that they wanted waffles before they went to school. Mm. But, uh, you know, that every I feel like you have to account for at least an hour before you have to do something, which yes. I, I actually thought that this um, interview was an hour later. So that's why I had. To put <laughs> but yeah, it's like, uh, you know, if they have to be at school at 10, you got to get up at 830 and start everything. Yeah, you got to be up. At 830, just to mentally prepare yourself for what's to come. Yeah, you need to like you you need to give yourself like that mental prep time. The other day I was uh everything just hit the fan. Like our our, our nanny wasn't able to be here. So like I just scrapped my day, which was like totally fine. I was happy to do it. I love being able to like hang out with my kid, obviously. But I was like, let's go on a hike, let's get out of the house. I was near tears by the time I got in the car. I was like, we need to get some boots on you. We need a jacket. I need to pack some snacks. I need to bring all these things. So I'm like, and I think it's like the city person in me that does not like to make multiple trips in and out of the house. I want to do it all in one go, which just stacks the odds against me. <laughs> I'm oh, like yeah. six water bottles, 10 jackets, a backpack. Like I had all this stuff and then I got out to like, uh, our driveway and John's truck was just parked too close to mine. So I could not get Nora in the car seat. I <laughs> nearly flipped my shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, th those little things that just make you a full mental collapse. And it's like, <laughs> this was not that big of a deal. Uh, that, I know you get in the car and everything's settled and you're like, you've already flipped your shit. You're like, okay, time to just compose. And then I think I'm like, did any of my neighbors just see me like storming in and out of the house? <laughs> Yeah, your hair <laughs> where, uh, that happened to me last it was either last week or the week before uh it was raining so i got them all ready uh they were waiting to get in the car i had their snacks and milk and i was going to the car to put it in and my daughter was about to take a step out onto the porch with her socks on yeah so i like hopped back up on the porch and i just ate shit like my oh, foot no. came out and i just Full back bumped on the porch. Cereal went fucking everywhere. <laughs> then it's just like, I'm trying to like not like lose my shit at that moment. So I just like stood there and was like, Ugh. uh, I uploaded the video to TikTok. So, you know, uh, ring, ring cameras are good for one thing, and that's for people falling on the porch. Oh my God. Span that you put that up, you posted it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I missed it. I need to see that. That's amazing. Oh, my God. I love it. It's so funny, too, when, like, that moment happens and you're just like, you don't even get mad. You just kind of sit there stewing in your rage. That's, <laughs> that's when it's it's really, really bad. Yeah. Um, I feel like I can't picture you actually getting mad. What does mad Brody look like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I feel like most people can't picture me being happy, which is why it throws them off when I'm in public. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like it's funny kind of like leading up to this interview. Um, and as I'm like always trying to like book guests, figure out what we're doing on the show, blah, blah, blah. Like so many people are like, you got to get Brody King on. Like, I feel like you are like a favorite of the boys. Everyone loves you. Well, that's that's awesome. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I just have. I don't know. I have some good stories and I have a lot of life experience, I guess. <laughs> That's true. You do. Yeah. I I mean, I don't know these stories firsthand and we're going to get into them. Um, but yeah, you are a very layered fellow. Um, so that being said, let's start with a little God's hate, your band. Okay. Um, how just like kind of walk me through the hardcore music scene and what like your love of that is creating a band because as much as like I've been in and around it I understand to a degree the hardcore music scene but I want to know from your perspective where like that love comes from uh I mean so I started listening to music probably I mean I, music has always been around my dad listened to like black sabbath and like heavier alternative music like rage against the machine tool stuff like that mm -hmm. um when i was in middle school uh so this was like 90 
97, 98, 99-ish. That's when I started years. getting... Strong years. Yeah, when I started getting into, uh, like, punk rock music. So I started getting into bands like Rancid, uh, Black Flag, AFI, Offspring. And that was, like, that kind of, like, forged my pathway through, like, finding punk rock and, like, all those ethos behind it. And then I also liked, you know, metal music, like Slipknot and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, which, you know, hardcore music is kind of like both of those melded together. And it's just a more aggressive punk, uh, more violent punk rock, if you will. And uh, that that kind of always spoke to me. And then when I was in high school, like I, I really started going to like local hardcore shows and punk rock shows. And, um, you know, I found straight edge through hardcore music and uh what is yeah, the correlation just, between that between um hardcore music and, and straight edge i mean it was created in in hardcore music okay i uh, did the, see i didn't the, know that i honestly mostly know about the straight edge lifestyle through professional wrestling and obviously the guys that are associated with that yeah so i mean like obviously uh you know people don't drink and do drugs all the time but like the actual term straight edge comes from uh hardcore punk rock with a band called mm -hmm. minor threat yeah. named it. uh but yeah it's like uh that that's like we're like the common misconception like when people are like oh i'm kind of straight edge it's like no you're not it's like it's more of like an ethos and like a badge of honor than it is like you know this is what i am it's like these are this is like how i live my life type thing and it comes from you know the ethos of punk rock and hardcore music so it's like when a normal person is like i'm straight edge you're like yeah it's okay. Are you? Yeah. Are yeah. you? Let's really get to the bottom of that. <laughs> and they're like, well, I only smoke on the weekends. And you're like, you don't get it. It's fine. No, you cannot be a part timer straight edger. You're either in or you're out. <laughs> Shit or get off the pot. Yeah. You, you cannot, you can't ride the fence of that. No so, way. Okay. Yeah. And uh, from there on, it was just kind of all consuming. I mean, I've been in and out of bands for 10 years. Uh, Always hardcore? always hardcore yeah okay. okay uh and touring the world and um yeah making lots of friends and yeah i met my wife through it and oh cool yeah, okay much up until wrestling hardcore was my life yeah so i was watching some of the videos like of your band of you guys doing like live shows and stuff like it is very physical uh -huh. holy shit like <laughs> And you're saying like, oh, you like meet friends there. And it's like this really great environment. I'm like, oh, my God, I feel like I'd get my ass kicked if I was there. Like, how do you like physically? I mean, obviously, on the physical side of things as a professional wrestler, you know what you're getting into. But you were having people like grabbing at like your neck and like launching themselves into the crowd. Like you're dodging people left, right and center. Like that's pretty nuts. You, you get like beat up at those shows. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that get beat up with those shows. Oh, my God. Uh, it, somebody put it this way the the other day. They're like, it's a safe it's a safe space to do very unsafe things. Uh, <laughs> and that was like, you know, if it wasn't for hardcore and punk rock music, I'm pretty sure that I would have ended up somewhere much less enjoyable. Sure. Uh, you know, because you can go to these places and you can get out that that angst or whatever emotion that you have in you and like. If you get in a fight that night, that's what happens. If you know, you can release yourself how you feel you need to, kind of. Uh, within you know, there is like obviously sort of like guidelines and rules to it, but like it's all very loose. But yeah, yeah. you definitely, from an outsider looking in, you just see a bunch of people basically fighting each other. It's yeah. like you know, I've been knocked out by like some of my best friends, and it's just like you just get up, brushed off, and you keep going. Like, I saw this one dude, like in the circle of all of the chaos happening. And he's just like twirling around and like throwing basically Judas effects to everybody. I'm like, this, <laughs> what this guy doing? It's crazy. Yeah. But, hey, you found your spot. Love is love. And it's great. I just like, I, I just like, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I guess like was curious watching like how that all exists, how you fell into it. So great. Um, uh, what else are you listening to? Oh, uh, so my main things are pop music. And oh. so like my my yearly wrapped. Uh, oh, Spotify. what was on there? What is on your yearly wrapped? Number one was Dua Lipa. 
Uh, oh, no me too. I don't know if she was my number one, but she was definitely ranked for me. I loved that Dua Lipa album. It's so yeah. good. Yeah, and my kids are like obsessed with uh, Cold Heart, her and Elton John. So that okay. like it's like all the time. Um, I've not heard that one. I'm after listening to that. But yeah, I think my top five were like Dua Lipa, AFI, uh, and then just hardcore music. So it's like E Town Concrete, Gridiron, King Nine, stuff like that. It's just I uh, it's, I just got. <laughs> I just got buzzed on the the little chat here on our Zoom call that you're a big Harry Styles guy. Is this true? I do like Harry Styles, actually. Yeah, he doesn't what a dreamboat yeah. that guy is, huh? He's very hot. What a, he is such a babe. There's like that like androgynous charm about him. Plus, being British just adds to that. His fashion is amazing. Songs are great. I'm I'm a big fan. Yeah, um, I'm a fan of people that piss off normal people. So it's yeah. like him dresses and everyone is like you can't do that it's like why not <laughs> yes put on the pearl necklace and the high collared blouse and a, a nice wide leg pant walk that yeah walk the red carpet and own that shit it looks it, great you do it you know um while we're talking harry styles do you think that he spat on chris pine at the thing what do you think was all the drama with um don't worry darling i don't uh so do you know i know what i'm talking about i don't know much about it i just know that he was like seemingly having like a mental collapse and like the press release of that or everybody like, was yeah so i don't know it, it seems like maybe that movie just pushed a lot of people to their limit uh did you see maybe, that movie or, i haven't seen it yet no okay um so you worked in the film industry for quite some time yeah what, what did you do 15 years yeah i, wow. I was a that lighting technician um based in hollywood uh my dad did it my grandfather did it oh so wow yeah, third third generation set lighting technician. Damn! Wow, what movies did you work on? Drop some names. Give me some of the. Give me some of the goods. I worked on like all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. <gasps> I worked, like a bunch of Marvel movies, like Spider Man oh, movies. Uh, a lot of TV shows. Um, RuPaul's Drag Race, Parks mm. and Rec. It was like wow, these yeah. are like the name drops of name drops. Yeah, I got to I got to do some cool stuff. Wow. Who was your favorite person to work for or like being on set with? And like, you you know, you mentioned some of these like movies, shows and whatever. Those are like some big name stars. It's always really interesting being around people like of that stature, people that like still remain really impressive when you see them on a set like that. Who are some of the people that were like really cool to be around? Uh, Johnny Depp is really awesome. Like he's very social and like the production crew tells you like not to talk to him because he just <laughs> won't stop talking to you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, Tom Hanks was really cool. Uh, but I feel like. On, what did you do you, with Tom Hanks? What movie? You're the coolest. Yeah. Uh, Nick Offerman uh, from Parks and Rec was. Yeah. Awesome. Like he would just like stand around and just like tell everybody like the idea, like scrapped ideas for Parks and Rec. And like they were. <laughs> but yeah, it, like there's definitely a lot of cool people. And then like the people that you would think are cool are just like not at all. Were there conversations that you were having with people when you're like kind of rubbing elbows and shooting the shit like this that, that like professional wrestling gets brought up? Uh, sometimes, yeah. But like uh, it, it was funny because when I was in Ring of Honor, um, I was working on the show The Neighborhood that's currently on CBS, I think, uh, Cedric the Entertainer show. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of the people that are on that show, a couple of cast members, uh, found out that I was a wrestler and they were just like super interested in that. Uh, this is like right when I got signed to Ring of Honor. So I had a couple indie dates and we had a, a show. There was a GC, GCW show in L.A. And uh, I was like, hey, do you guys want to come out to a wrestling show? And they're like, sure. What so, a show to bring them to. Come on out to so, GCW. MDK, baby. It, it, it gets better. <laughs> So they come to the show and it was the show that David Arquette wrestled. Nick oh Gage. no. <laughs> Stop. Oh my God. So what they must have freaked being like, oh, we know David Arquette. Great. Let's watch this. A cut to like 10 minutes later. Yeah, I don't think that they realized that like David like almost died in the match, but like they were like, that was insane. Like, I can't believe David Arquette was here. And like then they were like also like, you know, blown away by like me being a wrestler. So mm -hmm. it's like you know, I, we go back to set, and then, like, they're, like, bragging to, like, Cedric, to, like, yo, like, you gotta check it out. And it was funny, because, like, uh, this was at the time where, like, 
AEW, I think, first started getting TV and first started kind of blowing up, like, mm -hmm. you know, to everybody. And they were like, yo, you got to get on this AEW stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, no, I want to. Like, <laughs> so yeah. it, it was funny. And like now, like, they, we still follow each other on social media. And it's like, when I got announced for AEW, they were just like, yo, what's up? Like, like, kind of gave me props That's for that. That's so, so cool. That was, Oh, I love that. So being a performer yourself, but then also working like behind the scenes on all these shows and stuff, like what kind of inspiration were you able to draw from sitting? I know those are like long kind of boring days, but when you're like kind of watching those people work and like the who's who work, were you able to like pull some inspiration from some of that? Um, Not really. I, I don't no. know. I guess like, like it just like, knowing that anything is possible like you i kind of like i feel like i know how to make most things with less so it's like whether it be like uh set designing or like prop building stuff like that like there's always a way to do something without like without a budget sure. like for, for instance the other day I, I had to make like a like a sponsored video for somebody and i was like i need to make this look cool and it's just like in the middle of my basement, I just took like uh, this old china cabinet I have and then like an old card table and I put some like LED lights into it. And it's like, there was like, where were you? Like, it looks like a Western like saloon. I'm like, oh, I was just in my basement. Like, so it's like, you know, you just make it work with whatever because you have to be on the fly and like you mm -hmm. have to make things work quickly in, in the movie industry. Um, in the wrestling industry, <coughs> set wise, what are some things that you would like to spice up? Are the things on like the the main set, like from like the tunnels that you walk out, something there that you think could look really cool, or even on like the backstage set? Are those conversations that you've had at all um, with Tony? Uh, no, not really. I mean, like I feel like you know stuff like at like the fan fest and stuff. I feel like we can really there's a lot of room for improvement there, just to like give the fans a better experience of like not just having like concrete walls and stuff. I feel like you know pipe and drape goes a long ways and you know sure. filling filling the empty space uh you know if there's just like a wrestling ring in the middle of a giant room it helps a lot yeah but uh, you know i think like for the for the themed shows we, i know we've done it a couple times but like um you know for shark week we had the giant shark cage and there was like mm -hmm. some like aquatic stuff like on the stage I, I feel like you know for the theme shows we could do more stuff like that that yeah. isn't that have been it kind of just it just adds something else to look at and something else to like be like oh that's different like i feel like you need to have like two contracts i think you need to have like the pro wrestler contract but then also like on like the set design team <laughs> i mean get, get the man paid i'm open yeah let's do the damn thing um okay so you're in the hardcore music scene um that started pretty early on for you, you said like you know 96 97 98 somewhere in there yeah um you're a third generation set designer lighting all of that when did pro wrestling sort of make its way into your world uh when i was 26 years old okay uh, okay so basically uh i was doing set lighting i was touring with my band you know i was making good money but i didn't like love my job uh you know at the end of the day it's like you said it's long hours very physical uh it's in a nutshell, it's basically just construction. It's the thankless but, job too, it, right? It's like, it, yeah. And which is like, you know, going to that is, I feel like every crew guy, when I'm like walking out, I I try to thank like all of them that I walk by and they all just look at me like, was he talking to me? It's just like, I feel like <laughs> you're just, they're not used to that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just want them to know, like, I've been on this side. I know how it is. Like mm -hmm. you guys are doing a great job and I feel like, uh a lot of uh my peers maybe don't think about that on a daily basis like sure and you know with the amount of money that we were able to make like i mean scott the sky's the limit really with a pro wrestler it's like these guys are making you know a, a normal living wage and like working their asses off and they're there before we're there and they're after we're there so it's yeah. like they definitely deserve more praise, I feel and like. And it's not like they're local crew that's hired, right? These are guys that are still traveling the same as everybody else's. They're away from their family. I mean, yes, sometimes there is local crew brought in there, obviously. But, like, a lot of times it's like those those behind-the-scenes crew people are, yeah, they're traveling the same grueling schedule that everybody else is. Yeah, and it's like, you know, these are the guys that, you know, 
in the heat of the moment you're barking orders at and then they just make it happen. So it's like, yeah, you know, give them a, give them a little thank you on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, for real, give a little love to those guys. So, uh, so yeah, I was, I was doing set lighting, not really loving my job. Um, I was with my wife. We've been together for almost 11 years now. Hell yeah. Uh, so, you know, she kind of was with me through the whole thing. Um, I started set lighting when I was 18. So it's like, I started very young mm-hmm. and making adult money when you're very young is not always the best thing. And I, I, I think that a lot of pro wrestlers can vouch for that as well. It's like, you're just kind of a shithead. You think, you know, everything. Mm-hmm. And like you burn a lot of bridges. And then like when you move out of your parents' house and you get real bills and then you're like, Oh fuck. Like the phone's not ringing as much as it should be. Yeah. Uh, I need to, I need to start, you know, making amends and, and putting my head to the grindstone. And yeah. that's kind of what I did. And I feel like around like 24 is when I started to figure it out. And so when I got like more serious with my job and like, that's lucky. I feel like that's still pretty early on to like get that reality check. But like you said, you started at 18, so you still have some years under your belt to like check yourself. Yeah. And, and luckily, you know, my dad had like such a uh, respected name in the business and like, I felt like for a couple of years, I was definitely tarnishing that his legacy, but you know, I, I I feel like most people realize, you know, you're just a kid, you're figuring it out. You'll get there or you won't. Um, And I feel like that goes with most things in life. You either get there or you don't. And you know, you just have to make that choice on your own. So I started like figuring it out. Um, I bought a house and like we were, doing great and then i was just, my one of my friends started uh he his girlfriend was an in arena host for the la kings okay. and there was an old pro wrestler that was like a mega kings fan and she knew that her boyfriend is, it, like, is this carlin it is carlin yeah oh love her what oh, a I, dream I, about that chick is yeah big fan so so carlin's doing in arena hosting she meets this older wrestler and he was like basically, hey, if if your boyfriend wants to, you know, run the ropes, take a bump, whatever, I can, I know a school that I can take him to. And uh, her boyfriend Colin is my best friend. Okay. So one day, I he's posting photos of him running the ropes, and I'm like, what? How? Like, how are you doing this? It's like, <laughs> pro wrestling was like probably my first love. Like, yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, He Man, and pro wrestling. That was like. <laughs> Uh, so it's like, I always used to say, like, I wanted to be a pro wrestler when I grew up, like when I was in high school or junior high, people would be talking about whatever. And I'm like, I want to be a pro wrestler. It's like, but I never knew the steps to take to get there. I didn't know the pro wrestling schools. And then like, you know, when you kind of start to grow up, like that kind of goes to the back of your mind and Mm -hmm. you don't think about it as much. Uh, but that like kind of sparked an interest. I was just like, well, I, I want to try this just to try it. Like, like you said, you know, hardcore music is so physical that I felt like, you know, this is going to be easy. Like, it's not going to be like as jarring as a, a, you know, a normal wrestling fan who's never done anything physical goes into wrestling school and they're like, oh boy, what have I got myself into? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we went to the our local wrestling show. Uh, it was Santino Brothers Wrestling Academy, and uh, they were having a student showcase. And the next day I signed up for their beginners class. Oh my gosh. I, so this is actually like, I love doing this podcast because I love hearing these stories. Cause it really is that thing. I think like when you think of like the base of it, of like, Oh, I want to be a pro wrestler, but like how the hell does somebody actually accomplish that? If it's not a thing that's right in front of you and tracking down the schools and then like actually putting in the work to do that, it's not this hobbyist kind of thing. You're like really seeking that out I find that really fascinating of like what those first steps are that first day taking that first bump finding the first person that like really took you under their wing like I find all that stuff so fascinating yeah so my pro wrestling experience was I feel like very old school uh my trainer Joey Chaos like he never wants to put out uh, a product that isn't you know ready to do an entire match they can't call a match call on the fly stuff like that Mm -hmm. um so my pro wrestling training was about a year and a half before I had my first match. And even then I, I felt like I wasn't ready. So it's like, 
you know, I know that there's a lot of kids that go to like these like three month schools or whatever. And then they're like working on TV. I'm like, Oh boy, I would have been scared shitless. Like, I don't know how you guys, but that stresses me out and I don't wrestle. I'm like, what's happening here? (laughs) Uh, but yeah, those first days were like definitely eye opening. Uh, you know, obviously the cardio, the physicality, like the physicality was fine. Like as far Mm -hmm. as like taking chops, forearms, bumping, like stuff like that. I've done that forever. Like you said, I'm getting hit in the, in a mosh. Oh my God. Diving off to us off the stage and nobody it's like, yeah, I'll take your ass kicked. (laughs) So it's it's like, we started like learning dives. Like my Lucha coach was like, Hey, who wants to try it first? And I was like, Oh, I'll do it. I just did like a toe pick on heel, like a flip dive over the top, like right away. He's like, how do you know how to do this? And like, we started talking and it turns out that my lucha coach was actually like in hardcore bands. And then like, it was like, I knew that was such a transferable skill. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, I I mean, I didn't at the time. And then it's like, obviously in pro wrestling, but it's like almost everything that I do in pro wrestling is, is because of hardcore music, like the intensity, the physicality, like the selling yourself as a professional, like, all these things I learned from punk and hardcore music. So that those lessons were truly invaluable. And I didn't realize at the time that I was, you know, learning these things that were going to like set me up kind of for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's so funny how like certain things, like it's almost like the seeds are like planted and then it all just kind of comes together. Like in that big, like Oprah aha moment, Um, which leads to you working with Malachi now as well, like working with House of Black, you guys just kind of like re-emerged on the scene. What was that time like for you guys not being on TV and having that little bit of a break? Uh, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to take a break because I felt like I had a lot of momentum at the time. But not just that. I felt like I was really uh, getting in my groove in AEW and like really showing like who Brody King, the professional wrestler, was. Yeah. Uh, I, I got to wrestle darby uh twice i got the rest of john and it's like i feel like those three matches really put me on the map like where people were just like oh he's just like malachi's sidekick to like oh shit he's like a threat like yeah Yeah. and i felt like those were and those were the moments that i was waiting for it's like it was never like me questioning if i could do it it's like when i can do it Mm -hmm. and i feel like that it all came at the right time and um yeah going into the break i just felt like it might have i was worried about it taking the momentum away but yeah you know we made this return and it was awesome and the whole crowd was like standing on their feet and i feel like it, it was almost like we didn't miss a step and i feel like that's really rare in wrestling because fans are so i don't want to say fickle but like they they forget about you quickly uh sure. especially if not right in front of them yeah. so for for them to give us that reception was was awesome well even like i think of like when you debuted with aew and like what a huge reception you got i do feel like you like landed on the scene everyone was like oh shit brody king's here this is amazing and then like seeing you paired up uh with malachi just made like perfect sense like i definitely don't think people thought that you were just his sidekick but for you to be able to have those singles matches and yeah really kind of like solidify yourself plant your flag um was fantastic uh but yeah i mean so with house of black what um what do you guys want to accomplish what's the plan uh us versus everyone you know yeah. it's kind of kind of like how we live our lives outside of the world like you know me and malachi both come from hardcore music uh he kind of dips more into like black metal and stuff like that whereas i stay more kind of in my lane in hardcore punk and like death metal adjacent but um does he do more of like does he do like scandinavian death knows he'd stay more like european with it uh i don't know like he i don't know either (laughs) yeah like as far as like black metal that's like a little out of my range and i just don't really care for it but okay you know the the aesthetics of it are really awesome and which is where we draw a lot of inspiration from as well yeah but uh, we have like the same thought process when it comes to like the world and like how we conduct ourselves and like you know we're we're very much on the same page when it comes to that uh so it it makes it easy when we're coming up with like concepts of like how we want to look how we want to present ourselves and Mm -hmm. 
I feel like, you know, when it comes to AEW, we are delivering a product that they don't have. And yeah. I feel like wrestling, we're delivering a product that nobody has. Yeah. You know, there, there's people that have like the spooky gimmick or whatever you want to call it, but it's like, this is authentic to us. Like this isn't us putting on a costume, pretending to like the music that we like, like we have deep knowledge on all things that, of what we're doing. You know, yeah. Malachi reads all these weird old books on witchcraft and like black magic and stuff. And it's like, I'm constantly reading comic books and play magic, the gathering and listen to alternative music. So it's like when we're like, we never want to present something that we are not actually involved in. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think that's, that's a thing I think as well that you kind of like learn over time and working with the people that are like-minded with you. Cause yeah, I feel like you get sniffed out very early on. If you were just like playing a gimmick of a thing, that's not actually true to what you're into. Um, it just falls flat every single time. Yeah. Um, Julia Hart. Talk to me about bringing Julia Hart into work with you guys. And you guys plan to expand house of black beyond what uh, the four of you right now. You know, uh, I, I would say no right now, but you know, if the great Muda ever sent in his, uh, (laughs) you know, even though he did cost us a match, we might have to consider, um, but, uh, I would say right now we are very much like kind of a hive mind. We, we all kind of want the same thing and kind of like know the trajectory that we want to go in, uh, Bringing in Julia was interesting because, you know, obviously, like, on the outside, like, a 19-year-old cheerleader makes no sense to be with yeah. us. But then, like, yeah. she joins the group and it's like, she fits Who's in. Who's this Stevie perfect. Nicks, babe? What's going yeah. on? It's and, and so it, good. It was funny because, like, uh, you know, even when it came down to making her music, um, my best friend Colin, he plays drums and writes all the music in god's hate uh he him and his brother have a million bands but like they're very well respected and known in the hardcore scene but uh he wrote their their band dead body actually wrote the new um house of black theme he wrote he wrote um julia hart's theme uh he wrote the song that evil dan housing came out to so it's like oh cool and he He's like a massive wrestling fan too. So for him, like he didn't make it to be a wrestler, but to have his like influence in wrestling now is, is really cool for him. But uh, when he was making Julia's music, he's just like, what, like, what do you want it to sound like? And Julia just goes, well, I like like nine inch nails and Marilyn Manson. And we're like, I feel like everyone just like, I kind of turn it like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so didn't that like, one coming. <laughs> it's like wait there's more here than we than we think <laughs> yeah yeah, and then, yeah yeah we were uh it was before <clears throat> um what was it i think it was before all out so she came in a double or nothing yeah so before all out uh me and my wife took her to the mall to like find something for her entrance here we've like become like her wrestling parents uh, <laughs> But she like found like this black dress and then she just like picked up the the hat and she's just like, I really like this hat. And she put it on and we're just like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And it's like, now people are calling her like tiny taker or whatever. But like yeah, <laughs> she has this like TV Nicks like vibe going and it, yeah. it worked. And like it's I, really cool. Yeah. You're like, right. it's, no one saw that one coming. It was so unexpected. And I was like, wait, I think I love this. Yeah, she's she was like this like bubbly like sweet cheerleader, and now she just like has the most resting bitch face on earth, and it's the best. <laughs> uh, what about trios titles? When you guys saw those being introduced to AEW, and obviously where you guys are at now, um, yeah, I guess just like your your reaction to the trios titles and what that um what that could look like for you guys. Uh, I feel like it's a matter of time. I feel like it's just the timing is everything and we're just waiting we're waiting to, for our time yeah you know obviously they're wrapped up in this best of seven series currently but i feel like with time you will see house of black go after those titles and 
take those titles at some point. Let's get the good stuff happening. It is time. <laughs> it is time. Um, okay, so we got to talk a little bit of wrestling. We may circle back to that in a second, but um, to completely switch gears, your family has a candy business. Is this true? Yeah, so my mom and my sister have like a, they do like caramel apples, like candy apples, and like they do uh, different chocolates and popcorn and all kinds of other stuff. My, my family has always been like very hustling driven uh yeah it's like, you guys work man so <laughs> it really starts going all the way back from when my dad started getting his days in the movie industry he was uh doing uh oil drilling in fresno and then like he didn't want to do that anymore so he my grandfather had an opportunity for him to get in the movie industry but uh while you're getting your days to get into the union and like becoming part of the union there's kind of a down period yeah so he went out and bought a trailer painted a trailer and then like put in an, a snow cone machine and like a hot dog carousel and then he was just like selling hot dogs and snow cones outside of home depot <laughs> and, and like that turned into like a whole concession business on the side for them for many years it was like my first job when i was like 12 years old um and then that turned into like a candy business and so yeah now they they do that during the holidays and they're very good it's called bb sweet treats on instagram and uh i'll get them to, to send you a box of uh please do uh, please do but also like maybe don't but please do <laughs> <laughs> what do you make do you do you like roll up your sleeves and get some stuff done uh so yeah i'm a, I'm a pretty pretty good cook um i like to smoke meat uh briskets uh, when you're pork. talking smoker are you like a traeger guy are you a green <coughs> egg guy what kind of a smoker are we talking here so if i have the time i like to have a stick burner which is just okay. like old school you know barrel smoker mm -hmm. with wood um most of the time i don't have the time so i i have a a yoder smoker uh so it's a pellet smoker that i that is very good, very expensive. <laughs> it costs a lot. Smokers I was like, are expensive as all when, hell. Holy when shit. When I bought it, I was like, oh, okay. But I mean, it, it makes a good product. Um, yeah. And I like to cook a lot of steak. So I'm, I've become really good at cooking steak. Hell yes. I bought a smoker um, pretty early on during the pandemic. I was just like, I want this. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to commit to the smoking lifestyle. Um, and I got a Traeger and I love it. I love that. I can just like, it's not the like stoking the fire and you know, that work being put into it. But I do love that. You can just like sift through the recipes, figure out. I did like a smoked queso on there. Oh my God. I smoked a pie on there one time. Oh my God. It's so good. There's a really easy, really good, uh, smoked baked bean recipe. Ooh. And basically, you just you go and you buy the cans of like um, pork and beans, mm -hmm. and, and you just do that: brown sugar, mustard, uh, and whatever barbecue sauce. I I make a barbecue sauce usually, usually, but you can get like a good barbecue sauce and put it in it. Yeah. And then you you cook bacon, and you use the bacon fat, and then you layer the bacon on top, and then you just put in the, the trigger for three hours, and it's incredible. That sounds amazing. I'm also starving right now. So all this food talk's kind of killing me. I just have like acid coffee just sloshing around in my belly right now. I need real food. Um, <laughs> taking things back to the wrestling side. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, your matches with Darby, your matches with John. Uh, what was it like for you getting in there and working with Darby and being able to like toss around a guy like him, like the matches you guys were able to have? So Darby and I have like, a storied history like we we started almost the exact same time in wrestling um we started coming up at the same time becoming popular and our our careers have always kind of like mirrored each other so like mm -hmm. um he was in evolve and then i i had like an evolve tryout match and it was against darby and we like it was in uh brooklyn new york and we beat the shit out of each other all over and i feel like from that moment on we kind of realized like we have good chemistry and like yeah. this is gonna, this is going to be everywhere so then we like wrestled at aew a couple times we wrestled at pwg uh 
I was actually the first person to ever take the skateboard stomp. Oh shit! <laughs> well, lucky, lucky, lucky me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let me but, try something real quick. Yeah. So it, we, I don't know. I I feel like when it comes to wrestling derby, we don't think about it. We just do it, and it's mm -hmm. just like he trusts me. I trust him, and it just makes for a really good product. Yeah. And, uh, you know, our two matches so far in AEW, we had um, the match where I beat him up a lot. And then we had the coffin match where he beat me up a lot, uh -huh. uh, bleeding all over the place. And, you know, I, I kind of went into that match being like, well, John bleeds all the time, so I have to bleed more than John. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good bar anybody wants to set, but hey, to each their own. Do your art. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, Darby's definitely my greatest opponent, and uh, I'm sure that our, our story is far from over. As the roster grows and changes and opportunities shift and happen, uh, you talk about that moment of building that momentum and having some of those really great singles matches. Who else do you really want to get in there and mix it up with? Or is there somebody that's maybe not even at AEW that you think should be there um, that you'd be able to kind of tangle it up with? Samoa Joe. Samoa Hell Joe. Hell yes. What an answer. Uh, you know, not to sound like a fanboy, he's probably my favorite wrestler of all time. Yeah. Like, good answer. Stylistically, and just like the type of person that he is, the type of wrestler he is, the way he looks. Like, I think that he is the perfect wrestler. Um, and, you know, I would just love to test myself against him. God, I would love to see that. That would be great. I feel like Samo Samoa Joe is also one of my favorite wrestlers. Um, he's like one of my favorite human beings. And just being able to like watch the way he moves in the ring, um, everything that he brings to the table, like athletic wise, mind wise, like the guy is just it. Um, and I feel like there's just like there's some really great matches left in Samoa Joe. And one of them should definitely be against you. <laughs> that would yeah. be uh <laughs> As far as people that aren't in AEW that I would like to wrestle, I mean, I feel like there's so many people that are just like taken up everywhere. Like as far as uh, I would, I would love to wrestle Shingo Takagi. I mean, that was that's another like big one on my list. Uh, yeah. You know, I would love to have a, a match against Okada, like a singles yeah. match. Them, I've been in a tag match. Uh, just like th these people that make so much out of so little like i feel like okada is so smooth and like when you think about his moves they're never like these complex crazy spots but like the matches are obviously like you know some of the best of all time in some people's opinions yeah uh the same with shingo it's like shingo just he does a lariat he does a couple of cool slams but like his I love a good lariat lariat just gets the oh. job done sometimes i love it it, it really does and like, i i feel like a lot of people throw lariats, but no one properly does it. And like, I, I think that I throw a pretty good lariat. Mm -hmm. uh, most people like, you know, I, I remember when I wrestled Alex Reynolds on Elevation, I I hit him with a really gnarly one, and he took like a really crazy bump, and everyone was just like, "Oh my yeah. god, are you okay? like?" Everyone in the back like asked him, and he was just like, "You're yeah, fine." And it's yeah. like. That's when you know that it's good is when someone yeah. like, when the boys are asking, hey, are you dead? <laughs> like, I would always think that when John was wrestling Seth, I would watch those two. And I'm like, holy shit. The way that Seth would take uh, the lariat from John always just like blew my mind. Seth just I mean, the way he moves is he's incredible. Obviously, John as well. Hats off. Um, <laughs> but yeah, love that. Um, so your time in New Japan from being in like Ring of Honor, New Japan, your time in AEW, um, to have all of those things kind of like culminating together, but specifically your time in New Japan, like what kind of things were you able to like pick up there? Um, and and who, who like who took you under their wing over there? Uh, so Rocky Romero is actually one of my coaches. Okay, uh, he was. I would say he he was like my finishing school. Like uh, I had my formal training under Santino Brothers Wrestling Academy. And then when I started wrestling, uh, Rocky was running a class in uh, in the Valley on Wednesday nights. And 
literally nobody showed up. It was like me and like three other people. And I was oh really God. serious wrestler, which was crazy because it was like $10 and it, we would be there for three hours and I got so much knowledge out of them. And I feel like Rocky is one of the most underrated wrestlers ever. Yeah. He's unbelievably good in the ring. Uh, everyone loves him. And like his, and now he's like, you know, more on the back end booking side of like New Japan. So it's like, obviously, he has a like a great mind for the business as well. Yeah. Um, so he like really took me under his wing, and I got to, uh, you know, I kind of started from the ground up at New Japan. Like when they had their first big show in in America, I was like, kind of like young boying on the ring side, like helped to put up the ring, break down the ring, like set everything up. Um, and then from there, I, I was doing a couple dojo matches, and then uh, I got to do a tour of New Japan uh, during the Best of the Super Juniors. I was like seconding uh, Marty Scurll when he was in the tournament. Um, so I was there for like a month doing that, and I got to, uh, you know, become close with guys like Trent and Juice when they were in New Japan. But um, I got to wrestle guys like Kojima and Nagata and like those guys really, you know, were really good to me and they were, they gave me a lot and like, they have always praised me and like, you know, messaged me like when I have good matches and that that's awesome because they're like legends and yeah. wrestling. And then it's like from there, I feel like I climbed the ladder like perfectly. And then during the pandemic, we started doing strong and, uh, yeah, I was basically on every strong through the entire pan pandemic yeah. and yeah. kind of growing that product and then like wrestling the guys when they would come over. I got to wrestle Kenta. I got to wrestle uh, Ishii. And then my last match with New Japan so far, I, I wrestled in, and beat uh, Minoru Suzuki, which was like... What that a was, moment, huh? Oh yeah, my that, God. When I, when I did When that happened, it was like that was the icing on the cake. And I feel yeah. like that was... Um, that was New Japan's like seal of approval. Like they're like graduating me. They trust me now. And like, yeah, that's a lot. Like, you know, when I first got my New Japan tracksuit, it's just like, wow, I'm like, I'm doing it. And yeah. you know, that was like my goal as a wrestler was always to work for New Japan. And um I I was not like a WWE guy really, like, especially coming in like later in life. I feel like right. that just wasn't something that really appealed to me. And and as like an older person i i saw new japan as like this like you know that's where you go to like hone your craft and that's where you right. learn to become a professional wrestler and i feel like during the pandemic i like almost completely switched my style because of new japan it's like making a lot out of little and like just making moments and and, and uh you know having a good lariat is better than <laughs> like six shitty strikes uh yeah, yeah, yeah. but New Japan definitely made me a good professional wrestler. Yeah, no doubt. No, you're absolutely right in terms of like that, like finishing school to really like hone your craft and like the, the, I think like the respect in the business as well that you're able to get from, from your time being spent over there. Um, how happy were you to see that like AEW was having this amazing working relationship with, with New Japan while also then acquiring Ring of Honor? Yeah, I mean, it, it's awesome. Like, obviously, when I was with Ring of Honor, um, they they had the relationship with New Japan, so I was able to do a lot with New Japan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Ring of Honor was a place that was always a destination for me as well, especially, like, uh, towards the end of my indie run is when my wife got pregnant with my son, Dante, and that, that was like, oh, boy, I, I better start making some good money during wrestling or yeah. I probably can't do this anymore. Yeah. So th then I got signed to Ring of Honor, and it was like, okay, well – here we go and that ring of honor taught me how to work tv and then being able to do that in new japan at the same time was awesome and then coming out of ring of honor you know going into aew i knew that the relationship was not like very firm yet but it was kind of like a question mark at that time like yeah new japan wanted to stay loyal to ring of honor and now tony owns ring of honor so I We're feel all like friends. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, 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 there's a lot of people that I love there. And there's a lot of people that I would love to work with and see come here, you yeah. know, see like Osprey and Aussie open and like yeah. all guys like 
making a name for themselves on national television, like those are some of the best wrestlers on the planet, in my yeah. opinion. You know, yeah. seeing uh, Desperado and and uh, Conor Conor like be able to like show that they like their brand of wrestling on a national audience is awesome. Yeah, I agree. I think it is really cool. I think especially like. You know, I think when you hear some of these names thrown around and then actually getting to like see what these guys do, mix it up with some of the guys that are already over here. Like, I think it's just such a great way to like showcase talent, get people that experience. And uh, yeah, like literally having the best wrestlers in the world, just fucking ripping it up. Larry, it's all around. Yep. (laughs) Well, listen, Brody, I will let you get back to uh, to dad life. I mean, I know your kids are gone, so maybe like you can take a little breather for a second. Yeah, they're going to go eat lunch and hang out. (laughs) Yeah. 